This summer, the Hayward Gallery held a massive show of contemporary sculpture. One work which might have raised a few eyebrows among commuters on Waterloo Bridge was this one, an arrangement of stone blocks inscribed with a quotation from a famous French revolutionary. Nearby, posters combined similar revolutionary slogans with a denunciation of a distant Scottish regional authority, Strathclyde. They mark the latest stage in a bitter dispute between the region and the work's creator. The garden temple is already locked, closed. All a Scottish doors poet doors. took on the forces of law and order today to defend his property, a cowshed he converted to house his works of art. Ian Hamilton Findlay calls it a temple and says it should be exempt. The building at the heart of the dispute is the centrepiece of Little Sparta, a personal artistic world that Ian Hamilton Finlay has created on this bleak Scottish hillside. Here he has developed a completely individual form of art. Finlay describes himself as a poet. But these days, most of his works take on a physical form and are each part of a larger work, a garden, that, helped by his wife Sue, he's dug out and created over the last 20 years. In all that time, he has literally never left this piece of land while he's been engaged on a private artistic journey. The writer is he who finds it most difficult to put words into words. And this is not intended to be a clever paradox, it might seem so. To me, it is actual experience. Of your own experience? Of oh, my own experience, had, yes. yes. I have never felt at home with language. And I know that the common conception is that people who are, as it were, good with language are the people who are at home in it. I feel the opposite, that the people who really understand language are the people who feel it as extremely difficult and dangerous. Finlay's use of words has never been orthodox. Early in his career, he became interested in concrete poetry, in which the meaning of a poem is contained in the shape in which the words are arranged. From here, it was a short step to taking words off the page and putting them onto physical objects. This approach to poetry began early, when he suddenly found himself unable to write in a conventional way. When I ceased to be able to write poems in that way, I was very astounded because I liked it and I was very home and I couldn't understand why it stopped, but it had simply gone away, just like that. And uh, I was unhappy, and then I got this quite absurd idea that the only thing that would be true to my feeling to do was to make toys. And this is ridiculous, but nevertheless. Now, the point about the toy was that it was something that was non-didactic and yet had meaning and was sufficient in itself and was simple and to some extent pure and that was the only way I could think of realizing those things so at this time I had no money at all and I, I, I had um, whatever that money is you get from the state I forget what it's called and uh, there wasn't enough of it and I spent two well, at least half of the week hungry. And I didn't have any money for anything. But anyway, I got hold of some cardboard and a pair of scissors and some glue. And I made absolutely hopeless little cardboard toys. The first one I made was a sledge. And I was quite ridiculously pleased with this. Finlay is a passionate, self-taught scholar, but often it's seemingly mundane or even unlikely objects that prompt his imagination. 
In his hands, they take on new and sometimes playful lives. There's a constant interplay between an object's identity in the real world and in that of Finlay's imagination. Just for a particular definition in your own case, uh, how would you explain to people whose idea of poetry is what you are writing, rhyming lines and moving words, that the making of a sledge out of a piece of cardboard was to do with, in your opinion? Well, I couldn't explain. All I could say is that, that uh, all art is the, uh, the, 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 the achievement of a form which must begin from the intuition of form. And the little sledge was my totally solitary, inept way of achieving a form that was true to what I saw inside me. Had I not been Scottish, had I as it were, belonged to civilization, <laughs> I might have come more directly to concrete poetry. You, you know, without that kind of agony that I went through. Was but part of the crisis to do with being Scottish? When Was that a throwaway remark that had you belonged to civilization, or do you think Scotland is to an extent outside it? To some extent, every Scottish person who actually manages to become part of civilization has had to as, uh, invent civilization for themselves. That is to pursue it as a solitary activity. Uh, for whatever reason, the, there is no civilization in Scotland. Uh, Scotland is a shadow on my heart. Uh, I don't want to think about it. I'm glad you said that, and not I. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who was born just across the border and has had a fearful relation with Scotland <laughs> all his life. <laughs> yeah. Would you describe the work in your garden as a uh, uh, poetry, it seems to include a lot which is to do with sculpture and a lot which is to do with painting, but do you basically see it as an extension or development of your concrete poetry? Yes, I think that I call myself a poet and that I think this is an exact term because uh, what concerns me is the, the idea as such, but the, 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 the lyric idea. And it, it is in that that I have some kind of absolute confidence that even when it deserts me, as it does, I have the faith that it is there in the world. It's the thing I believe in. So, in a world like Mary Nostrum, I'm using the actual tree as part of the work. The tree is taken up into the idea and Mari Nostrum is a Latin cliche used by the Romans to describe the Mediterranean in a somewhat arrogant way, our sea. And by being put on our actual tree, the meaning is changed. Uh, it's the tree, the sound of the tree becomes our sea which fills the whole garden with the sound of the sea. So the tree has become part of a lyrical concept or idea. You have to imagine that when we came, that all around the house was moorland with sheep grazing right up to the door. So that the, 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 the grass was up to this high. So I began by making a start on the sunk garden, which is to say I went down into the moor with a spade and dug a square hole.
The ground has been cleared and the garden has been created by hand and on very modest means. Finlay has never allowed lack of money or equipment to stand in his way. We began the garden simply because we had this house which had some ground around it. And my idea that one would, the, the poet or whatever, would always be the person who made the most of whatever actual situation he was in. So having the ground, one therefore began to have a garden. Wittgenstein has got a saying that it ends the Tractatus, a sentence that says something like, the things we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. But I would, my thing would be, what we cannot speak about, we must construct. So that one talks about the garden on the level of ideas, but beyond that, there's something which would be vaguely evoked by the word harmony which is really very basic to the whole thing and is perhaps the true content of the garden. The garden actually consists of several areas ranging in appearance from the relatively wild to the formal. Together, they create an intricate system of reference and illusion. The garden functions, as gardens have often functioned, as a, as it were, political statement or it suggests that, as it is possible to transform this hillside into a garden, so it is possible for man to transform the world, or society, or however. It, it, it is an example of uh, action, and that's very important to me, that it would have been possible to remain a notebook poet you know, but once given the possibility of an actual piece of ground, the thing of transforming it was irresistible. And having done that, one then realises the possibility of transforming the world. Today the garden, tomorrow the world, you know. Uh, this relates to another idea I have, that uh, the whole tradition of the garden has been lost somehow. That the garden used to be an art form on par with uh, painting and music and so on. And now the garden has come to be considered something that's purely to do with flowers. There is natural beauty in Finlay's garden, but it serves a larger purpose than simply to please the eye. His plants and shrubs are a setting for, and often an integral part of, particular works. This idea of the garden, as something more than a pleasant retreat, harks back to the 18th century. Then gardens were at the centre of the culture, embodiments of the civilization of their day and of man's relationship to nature. Painters, too, explored this relationship. Their idealization of landscape and preoccupation with the picturesque had a great influence on gardens of the time. Finlay's work is in that tradition, but it's also a comment on that tradition. He's constructed this landscape as a tribute to the lasting influence of two particular painters. This particular little vista has got the classical element of the fairly ordered little island, the water, the grasses, which are partly wild, and yet I thin them too. And at the far end of it, beyond the leaves, is the obelisk. Uh, a few elements which everyone could recognize really as being classical. The, the stone uh, serves, as it were, as a very reticent caption. Uh, it's small and formal and has what's called knocked-off edges, which helps it to 
take its place in the scene. The, the wording, si poussin here, Lorraine, is intended to su suggest the idea of looking at the miniature vista in two ways. One, in the manner of poussin, which would be firm, precise, modelled, planar and volumetric, and in the other, in the manner of Lorraine, which would be uh, musical, lyrical and gentle. But it also suggests the possibility of, well, not the possibility, the fact that one looks at landscape through tradition, whether one is aware of it or not. The garden is full of tributes to artists and thinkers who, in his opinion, have made the greatest contribution to our world. His monuments to them are made of living things, or he means to suggest that their influence isn't dead, but is still growing and alive today. Where he admires particular artists, he finds a way to memorialize them. In the case of Dürer, he's actually grown a version of his famous painting, The Great Turf, and signed it with Dürer's monogram. The modern world is this curious idea of tradition as being something that stands outside and is set against the individual, whereas I experience tradition as something that rises up from inside myself. And insofar as I read, which I do, the process is one of clarifying or explicating intuitions, feelings, ideas which one has already arrived at. Therefore, I don't experience tradition as something alien outside of me that has to be brought in, but something in that is brought out and explicated. And it seems to me that this is not true just about me, but should be true about tradition in general. I don't think you would jib if one described you as a classicist. Not at all. So what does the classical idea mean to you, and why do you think it's particularly, as you obviously do, particularly important now? Well, the, the question is, in a wee way, like another question people ask me, why are you so fond of boats? I mean, there's no answer to it, because I, I always feel like, well, who wouldn't be fond of boats? Likewise, who wouldn't be fond of the classical? Because it's like saying, why do you feel affectionately toward the world of which you are part? Our world is the classical world, or was the classical world, comes out of the classical. So one is talking about one's own home. And indeed, that's how I experience the classical, uh, as my home. Come on. Come on, then. <laughs> The hut is there to hold the geese which allegorise Rome, and they are in fact geese of the kind called the Roman breed. In legend, geese are said to have saved Rome from invasion by waking the guards. We only have two, but it's quite sufficient to allegorise that event. The hut had to be of a classical kind and is of the simplest possible Doric construction. The hut was necessary to complete the column and is really uh, the, the, the column and the hut and the wilderness beyond and the wild garden all together make a kind of total work. Although Finlay's essays on classicism can take light-hearted forms, he does see the classical tradition as embodying a particular integrity and sense of order. Uh, 
I mean, if you take classical architecture as an architecture in which one can see very clearly that this part of the building has that function, the plinth and column have that function, this, this sits on that. There's a, a, a frank acceptance of, so to speak, the universe, and at the same time, a very precise, harmonious ordering of that. That, I see, has been classical. Uh, and th the thing that it is opposed to is the notion of the self, self-expression, my interesting feelings, etc., etc., blah, blah, all of which is of no interest to me at all. Finney is able to locate the old classical idea of order in apparently unlikely images. One way of regarding the aircraft carrier, the, both the real carrier and its representation, is as a model of the cosmos or universe, as the Greeks might have understood it. That is as a dynamic unity. And the, the, the carrier perfectly combines earth, air, fire and water, in the sense that it goes on water, its element is water. It's earth for the plains, whose element is the air, and which distribute fire. But the thing is that it's not only a unity, but a dynamic unity. And I feel that the Greeks would have been absolutely amazed at carriers. The Roman garden is intended as a miniature or chamber music version of a Renaissance garden. And the Renaissance gardens or gardeners were absorbed in Roman gardens or inspired by Roman gardens. And one of the main sculptural themes in Roman gardens was the Roman War galley. So in wishing to recreate the Renaissance, Renaissance garden, I used the aircraft carrier as being the imperial navy of today. It's a straightforward transposition war galley, imperial war galley for imperial aircraft carrier. Is this suggesting an acceptance or an even embrace on the part of classicism of the notion of a military element? To bomb? Well, it's not, it's not a question of being worried about weaponry. It's a question of the modern to the contemporary pretense that the world is other than it is, the pretense that death doesn't exist, that, everything, that nature is harmony, and so on. I would wish an art which could confront, as the Greeks tried to confront, reality, part of which is a fact of power. Now, how one would deal with the fact of power is a separate question. You know, to use the warship is not to say, therefore I wish there to be giant navies or something. It is to allegorize or present the fact that power exists. Finlay, in his own personal life, is more aware than most of the realities of power. For years, he's been involved in a dispute with Strathclyde Region over the status of this building. The region calls it a public art gallery and demand payment of rates. Finlay says it's a temple and therefore exempt. Garden temples were a feature of 18th century gardens, but for Finlay, his version is no mere facsimile. He sees it as a polemical statement reflecting his belief that our culture has become spiritually impoverished. I became increasingly aware of the fact that in some way 
the meaning of the words, the arts, had become eroded, that hitherto, traditionally, within our culture, the arts, had, the idea of the arts had implicitly included some notion of beauty, and that specifically in relation to the good, and some notion of aspiration, and some notion of piety. Or in short, the arts had overlapped to whatever degree with the area which we denote with the word religion. But now they had come to overlap with the areas we call entertainment and tourism. <laughs> Lookouts were posted at dawn as Poets' Corner prepared for the showdown. A cardboard tank dug in, defended the controversial converted cowshed. The sheriff's officer, Sandy Walker, had arrived at Checkpoint Sandy. Strathclyde Region did not see the situation in quite the same terms, and eventually dispatched the sheriff's officer to seize works in lieu of payment. Mr. Walker broke into the temple or gallery but the artworks he was after, three sculptured wood nymphs, had been spirited away. Poet Hamilton Finlay emerged from his hideout. The showdown was over with round one to the poet. The sheriff's man said he may be back. And he was. He returned on budget day, when the press were otherwise engaged, and removed a number of works from the temple. Finley fought back. He has masterminded a guerrilla campaign against the region. Although the tone is humorous, his commitment to the issues involved is total. So the war goes on and will continue to go on. And will, I mean, it, I'm quite prepared that it will end up with my being in prison, I think that's extremely likely because I don't see the region uh, backing down. It's not within them to be rational in that sort of way. If you were sent to prison, what do you think you would be going to prison for? Oh, I, I would, I'm quite clear about that. I would be reminding the world that at one time the arts contained the idea of aspiration, piety, morality, goodness and beauty, in my own wee way. I mean, that would, might be a very necessary thing for me to do. I'm quite prepared for it. But uh, I wouldn't be the important thing. I mean, we are not the important thing in this at all. The important thing is that, 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 that a conflict which the culture hasn't faced about itself has emerged in this perfectly trite, ludicrous form of a dispute about rates. I would like to think, as I said somewhere, that um, garden centres should become the Jacobin clubs of the new revolution. But certainly the, the suburban garden could cease to be a suburban garden and could become, well, fill it with triumphal arches. Uh, everything in our garden is on a small scale that could be achieved equally well in a suburban garden. And suburban gardens could become imaginatively immense things. Well, we've got a very small cottage and in a sense, what we have is only a cottage garden. But in another sense, it's a grand 18th century garden. And there's no reason that other people couldn't do this too. And this could be the beginning of the next revolution. <laughs> <laughs>